So um, hang on to it. We're not going to quite take it yet. I, I'm going to talk a little bit first, but um, sorry if you already opened it. Um, if you could title today's message, I, I think, it, I, I think you, you'd call it Marry Me. And really, Jesus giving his body and blood is, is him getting down on his knees, humbling himself, giving up his life, saying, will you marry me? Will you be mine? Will you be my bride? It's a, it's a proposal. And, the begi- and so in John chapter 2, um, Jesus, before he's ever done any miracles, before he's ever, ever done anything, he lived 30 years as a man. He, he, didn't, he, didn't, he could not do any miracles without the Holy Spirit. So the, the first, it says the first, the beginning of signs he did in John 2 was the turning water into wine. And I love that because Jesus came to establish a new covenant, and it's a covenant of grace. And we're no longer under the bondage of the law. And so Moses turned water into blood, a covenant of life and love. And so I, I, I think that there, there's no greater reward given to man than to become the bride of Christ. There's no higher place in eternity than to sit on the throne with Jesus as one with him as his bride. You, there, there's no higher reward. And so in John chapter 2, um, I'm just going to read it. It says, On the third day there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Now both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding, and when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. So Jesus said to her, Woman, what does, that, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And oftentimes when Jesus says, my hour hasn't come, it's referring to his suffering. But here it's referring to revealing his glory. My hour has not yet come to reveal my glory. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. I I love that because she knew the scriptures, like honor your father and mother. And she's like, well, okay, whatever he says, do it. (laughs) He's got to obey. And so he says, now there were, there were set, there are six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification of the Jews, containing 20 or 30 gallons apiece. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. I love that because they're, it's for purification. It's, it's so for the Jews to be ceremonially clean to come into the presence of God. And there's six of them, and six is the number of man. And so he said, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. When the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew the master of the feast called the bridegroom. And he said to him, every man at the beginning sets out the good wine. And when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior You have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. So the first thing that Jesus ever did in the power of the Spirit is in the context of a wedding. And often throughout the scriptures, Jesus is referred to as the bridegroom, and he's always teaching parables about a wedding feast, bridesmaids. The kingdom of heaven is like a father who prepared a wedding for his son. He was like obsessed with this topic. He kept coming back to it. And so it, in, it, it, the master of the feast called the bridegroom because it was always in their culture, the bridegroom always supplied the wine. He was always the supplier of wine. And so on the day of Pentecost, when Jesus pours out the new wine, the Holy Spirit's the seal of the bride, and, she, and they're intoxicated with the love of God. And so when he gives us himself, he says, marry me, we get to drink of his, of the new wine of heaven. And what we experience in the spirit now is like the first fruits of the intoxicating love that we get to share for all eternity. The wine of heaven, the the new wine, the Holy Spirit, it's what seals and consummates the marriage. So they would drink wine in a Jewish wedding and it's what would seal them together. The wine was what would join them. And so the Holy Spirit is the seal who joins us to Christ. And he's like new wine. And so the joy of the Lord is our strength, right? Mm. Come on. Jesus. So 
Open, open your, take your communion. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, if I can find it, one second. He says in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you are not your own, for you were bought at a price? Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. And in Ephesians chapter 5, Bear with me. In verse 23, For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Notice that connection. In John 2, it was the water in the purification that it was a sign and wonder of how he would give himself to purify his bride and that she would be joined to him with the wine of heaven. So it's the washing of water by the word that she should be spotless, wrinkle-free, or not, not having any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish, that he might present her to himself a glorious church. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. This is why you must be healed. Because there's no sickness in the body of Christ, so there should be no sickness in you if you're one body with him. Hey, come on. And to the theology that, like, well, God gives people sickness, or sometimes he just lets us be sick, like, it says that no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it. Where is, where is there room in that for God to give you sickness if he nourishes and cherishes his own flesh? What, like, what husband would beat his wife? An ungodly one. <laughs> so, be healed in Jesus' name. <laughs> By his stripes, we are healed. And so it says in Romans 8, 11, that the spirit that raised Christ from the dead that now, now lives in us, and he will quicken our mortal body. So salvation, our spirit's made alive, our soul is being renewed, and our, our, our bodies will be saved at resurrection day. But that verse is saying now God wants to give us a taste of resurrection life in the body now. Like as Moses lived in the glory of God, and he was 120 as in his youth, that should be the normal Christian life if he quickens the mortal body. If he gives life to the mortal body, this, he gives life to the spirit, and then it affects the soul, and it's supposed to radiate out in the mortal body also. It's supposed to have an effect on all three parts. Sanctify your whole spirit, soul, and body until the day of salvation. So, when we take of the body, we become not just one spirit with him, 
This is in the context, it says in verse 25, he is the savior of the body. It's the same word for salvation, to bring, to bring life, to bring healing, to bring wholeness. He's the healer of the body. He's the restorer of the body. So we get to be one flesh with the Lord now. This is why he said, if anyone rejects you, they reject me. And so when Jesus, or when Jesus knocked Paul off his donkey, Paul was persecuting the church. He was beating the church. He was beating the bride of Christ. And Jesus shows up and he says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Because whatever happens to you, he takes personally. You're his bride. That's good. Woo, good so Jesus, right now we just thank you that you tend to us, to our spirits, to our souls, to our bodies. And we thank you that we get to be healed that by your stripes we are healed. You were pierced for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. And we thank you that there is life and power in communion. So right now we receive you, Lord, and we say yes. You are the bridegroom of the church, and we say yes, Lord. We will marry you. Seal us with the Holy Spirit. We receive you, Lord. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus, when he took wine, he said, I will never again drink of the fruit of this vine until that day when I drink it new with you. Meaning, like, Jesus, he's never again, he will not drink wine until he gets to drink it as a sign of being joined to his bride. He's taken of, that's why when he's on the cross and they offer him wine, he spits it out. He's like, no, I, I took a vow I'm not drinking that again until I get to enjoy it with my bride. And it's going to be the seal that consummates. Mm. Lord, I pray that as we drink of this cup, that the wine of heaven would fill the soul of every person here. Lord, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name. Since our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's important that we believe that we are the house of God. I wrote this down. Uh, I, I got this from a mighty man of God. He said, He sees out of our eyes. He uses our hands and speaks through our lips. He's the one who fills us, satisfies us, thrills us, and overwhelms us with himself. That is the new covenant. It's a covenant of love, a marriage covenant. We have to know that he lives inside of us. It's Christ in us, the hope of glory. He, like, you want to know where Jesus is looking? He's looking where you are. And it's a good question to ask ourselves, is what we're looking at pleasing to him? Is what we're looking at what he wants to look at? Because he sees out of our eyes, he speaks through our lips, he works through our hands. He is Christ in us. So Revelation 22, 17 There's 66 books in the Bible. There's 1,189 chapters. There's 31,101 verses. And there's 783,137 words. And the very last page, the last, the last passage of the last book says this, the spirit and the bride say come. It's all going to this glorious two becoming one. That's where the whole thing's headed. For, for Christ to receive his bride. And the bride is infatuated with the bridegroom. She's captivated. There's a deep, deep love that springs up inside of her that longs for him and him only. That's why Jesus said, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. 
I heard, I heard someone say this. Men do not acquire faith. They're reduced to it. When, they, when you surrender everything to him, when you give everything to him, that's when you're reduced to being fully dependent upon him, and that's where true faith is found. So Jesus like, laid out some serious boundaries. If anyone loves his, his mother or father or wife or children, his brothers or sisters, even his own life more than me, he is not worthy of me. That's like some serious standards because he's looking for an equal counterpart, a bride who has made herself ready. And we, we see it. It's all going to the spirit and the bride say, come. Hmm. Jesus, we love you. You're worthy, Lord. The spirit and the bride say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts come. For whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. I want to notice something. Now, this is just the word of God, okay? <laughs> the spirit and the bride say, come. And that's an interesting place to put something. You never say the peanut butter and the peanut butter. You don't say the deer and the deer. It's deer and elk, peanut butter and jelly. So you see the spirit and the bride say come, and let him who hears say come. Two different companies of people both appear to be saved. Matthew 25, Jesus teaches a parable called the Ten Bridesmaids. They're all dressed in white. They're all, they all have lamps. They're all waiting for the bridegroom. But only five of them were wise. So salvation is free. But listen to this. The kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were wise, and five were foolish. Those who were foolish took lamps and took no oil with them, but the wise took oil in their lamps. But when the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, a cry was heard, Behold, the bridegroom is coming. Go out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise answered, saying, No, lest there should not be enough for us and you, but go rather to those who sell and buy for yourselves oil. While they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the wedding, and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Assuredly, I say to you, I do not know you. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour in which the Son of Man is coming. Now, what's interesting to me about that parable is there's no mention of the weeping of gnashing of teeth or outer darkness. He just simply says, I don't know you. In Matthew 7, he says, I never knew you. But here it's a current knowing. Your, your, your love for me has waned. You've forsaken me. You're, it's, it would be like, like waking up on your wedding day and forgetting it's your wedding day. It's like, oh, man, I was supposed to get married today. Like, how foolish would that be? How would you feel if you're the guy at the, at the altar and, like, she just, like, is late? Like, sorry, I forgot. Like, you'd be like, no. Like, I'm not going to marry you now. What in the world is that? I remember when I was in the military, this was horrible. I, I just graduated my, my initial training course in Florida, and um, I was in the world. I was not doing well, and I had lived in this one dorm for like three months, and I was supposed to fly out to Spokane, and 
I like this, I just wanted to hang out with all my friends because we were all getting split up. And so I, I, I just partied with them. And then the next thing I know, like, wake up. I'm supposed to go to the airport in an hour. I haven't cleaned my, my dorm. I've been living in it for three months. I haven't packed anything. I'm just like, oh, crap. Like, the hours come, and I am not ready. <laughs> and it was like, it was chaos. It was not good. And this is what Jesus is saying. He's like, you, you, can, you can be saved. You can receive eternal life. Drink of the water of life freely, but make sure you buy oil. Oil's costly. Giving your life fully to him is a, if it's a different story than just receiving the free gift of eternal life. He wants a bride who has made herself ready. Now, here's where grace comes in. Because in Revelation 19, it says, It is given unto her fine linen. It's given to her. Yes, it's the righteous acts of the saints, but it has to be received. And so Paul always talks about, he says, put off the old man, put on the new man. And the word for put on literally means to sink into. Now, where do you change clothes? You don't do it here. <laughs> you don't do it at the grocery store, right? You do it in private. Where do you get to know someone? In private. We have to have a, a, an intimate relationship where we yield ourselves to him, where we lose ourselves in him. He literally, literally says this, put on Christ, sink into Christ so you're clothed with him so that when he comes on that day, you don't be found without oil. He says, watch therefore, be like those who are waiting for the master's return so that when he comes and knocks, you open to him immediately. And that should be our, our prayer life too. How, how I, man, I have had the Lord's presence come over me as an invitation to come be with him. And how many times have I said, give me five minutes, like I'm watching the game. That's not being like someone who waits for the knock so that we open to him immediately. And he wants to crush out all the idols in our lives. It says the pure in heart see God. If you have pure gold, it's only gold. There's no mixture of other metals. It's purely gold. And he wants to, our hearts to be pure so we can see him, so that it's only him. That there's no other lovers. There's no other idols. There's nothing in, in us that desires anything but him. I heard a crazy, crazy testimony about a mighty man of God from China, led 15 million people to the Lord, suffered for the faith, persecuted horribly and he went to heaven the Lord took him to heaven to, to rebuke him and he, he asked him this question he, the, the guy got really really busy in ministry and he got caught up in all of his ministry and he, he forsook the Lord his relationship with the Lord suffered and the Lord asked him this question he said what could you have, what could you have done better and he was like oh, I, I read my Bible more spent more time in prayer, and the Lord cut him off and, and sternly, lovingly, but sternly corrected him. He said, busyness is no excuse for me. Busyness is no excuse for me. And this message has, like, been burning on my heart because what, what is most important to us, really? Because we can sing, Jesus, I love you, but if it doesn't come from a heart that is infatuated with him, he knows the heart. And he's asking us, like, will you, will you humble yourself before me? And will you let me love you? He comes after, in Hosea, he comes after the bride, after she forsook him. In Revelation, chapters 2 and 3, he writes seven letters to seven churches. Now, we can't read all of them, obviously. But if we look at the last one, the letter to the, to the Laodiceans, it says, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing 
and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and that you would anoint your eyes with eye salve, and that you may see as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Notice he says, I counsel you, buy from me. Salvation is free. You don't buy salvation. You, he, who, he who's thirsty, come freely. Drink the waters of life freely. But if you want to be his bride, you have to give him everything. If you want to be the bride of Christ, you have to give him everything. He has to become everything. What can we offer God that would be of any value that we could purchase something from him? The only thing of value that we have is us. The only thing you can give him in exchange to actually purchase something from him is yourself. This is why Paul says, offer your body. Remember what we open with in communion. He wants to be one with us. Offer your body a living sacrifice. Holy and acceptable to God. Daily. You know why it's living? Because you, you can't choose. You, you, you have to experience the fire. It's a choice. You have to choose to stay on the altar. We have to choose to stay in the fire of his love. This is the cry of Jesus. Marry me. Marry me, church. Don't just come to church to receive what you can get. Marry me. So if we take the, 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 uh, one message from each of the seven churches, I wrote this out. It's so interesting to me because the, the first one, the first letter, he says, you've left loving me. I know your works, your labor, your perseverance, that you don't tolerate evil, but you don't love me anymore. Like these guys, they stayed away from sin. They didn't partake of the world anymore. They labored in the Lord. They served the kingdom. They, served, they preached the gospel. He's like, I know your works, but you don't love me anymore. And that's what he's after. He's after a people whose hearts burn with first love. This is the great commandment. May we never fulfill the Great Commission at the cost of the Great Commandment. The Great Commission must be fulfilled out of obedience to the Great Commandment. That Jesus said, he who loves me obeys me. If you fall in love with Jesus, you won't help but be obedient to him. If we're in love with him, we cannot help but be obedient to him. We can't help but hasten the day when he's going to come. We can't help but look forward to the day when we're, we're beholding him at the altar. Like Tom was saying, he's like, I, I just picture it. I get, we're on the beach and we see him coming and I'm looking at Jared and we're just like, we're made new and it's our bridegroom coming for the bride. But too, many, too often we, we get so caught up in the things of the world that we lose sight of the king. And he warns us. Look at Luke chapter 12. You know, you know why he says this? Because he's, he's saying, don't leave me at the altar. Don't leave me at the altar when I give everything for you. Don't let me stand there and be stood up. Marry me. Luke chapter 12, verse 35, he says, Let your waist be girded and your lamps burning. You yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding. That when he comes and knocks, he may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master when he comes will find watching. Assuredly, I say to you that he will gird himself and have them sit down to eat and will come and serve them. 
And if he should come in the second watch or come in the third watch and finds them so, blessed are those servants. You know what the second and third watch is? It's the time of the most darkness. It's when the sun is on the complete other side of the world and it's completely dark when there's no light. Are you still waiting for him when you can't see? Does your heart still burn for him when you're going through the most horrible trial of your life? That's why Jesus said in Matthew 7, he said, he, he who hears my sayings and obeys will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. But the foolish built his house on sand, meaning he didn't obey my words. And when the rain came and the floods came and beat and blew against the house, the house fell. The rain and floods are the trials of life. Do, does the trials of life have the power to put out your love for Jesus? Wow. Does the love that you have for the Lord get quenched when things don't go our way, when things don't turn out as they should? He says, what are you, what are you building your life on? Do you love my words? Do you sit at my feet? Do you obey everything I say? Are you attentive to me? This, I, 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 I meditate on this stuff, and I'm like, Jesus, purify my heart. Lord, let there be no mixture. Don't let, me, don't let me mix the things of the world with the things of God. He says in James, you adulterers and adulteresses, don't you know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? He wants to be everything. I, I hope that's not like too hard of a word, but Jesus is zealous for his bride. That's why he stood weeping over Jerusalem. He's like, if you had known what I had prepared for you in this day. I have longed to gather you as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He longs for his people. And his bride will make herself ready. So, if we, if we look at the last letter to the church of Laodicea, they get hammered for being like the corrupt church, you know. They're, they're the Laodiceans. They're like Jesus sternly rebukes them. He's like, you think you have everything, but you don't realize that you have nothing. This is the heavenly Hosea. He comes for his bride after she had left him for the world. She went back to harlot tree, and he comes for his bride, and he says, I still love you. Sometimes we can read this, this letter and think it to be a harsh thing when he says, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. No, it's him coming to you saying, listen, I still love you. I still love you. You might be stuck in sin right now. You might be stuck in bondage. You might have walked away from the Lord and he draws unto you. He's so humble. He will come to a harlot bride and say, I still love you. Come to me. Come to me. Marry me. Marry me again. Give yourself back to me. So if we take, I took one line from each of the seven letters of Jesus. The, this is the, what he had against them, basically. And this is what I wrote. I know your works, labor, patience, and intolerance for sin, but you've left loving me. Do not fear what you may suffer, nor compromise and pollute yourself. I know your hearts and minds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. So wake up and strengthen what remains. See, I have set before you an open door which no man can shut, that no man can take your crown. I counsel you, buy from me gold, white garments, and I salve. As many as I love, I rebuke and discipline. It starts with you've left loving me, and it ends with I have not left loving you. That's how it starts with this. You've left loving me, but it ends with a bridegroom coming to a harlot bride saying, but I have not stopped loving you. Can I get the band to come back up? By chance? Are they around? Yes. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the kingdom. And I thank you for your love. And I thank you that you sent your son because you've prepared a wedding day for him. But you've called his bride to prepare herself, to make herself ready 
to receive the fine linen you've offered her and to put it on, to put off the things of the world, to put on Christ. Jesus, as we offer our bodies, may we sink into you. May we sink into Christ. May we put on love. May we put on tender compassion, costly mercies, patience and loving kindness and mercy and humility and all the things you've called us to put on. And Lord, may we lovingly turn back to you. Now, this message isn't for everyone in here. Some of you are burning and are clothed in white. But I believe the Lord wants to, to, to sternly, sternly invite us to not miss out on what he has given us. Can you all stand with me, please?